salary negotiations. So with me, I would love to um, introduce my fellow panelists here as well. And um, so they're recruiters from Microsoft, Slack, and Stripe. And we're all really excited to chat with you all today. So first off, I would like to introduce to you Oscar. Oscar, will you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button, but here it is. Hi, everyone. My name is Oscar. I am a recruiter at Microsoft. I'm actually a UCSD alum. I graduated in 2014 from uh, Six College. And um, I currently work with the conferences and events programs at Microsoft. And uh, my team's uh, goal is to be able to increase uh, representation of women, uh, Latinx talent, and Black talent at Microsoft, specifically in technical roles. Beautiful. Thank you, Oscar. Thanks for being here. And next up, I would like to introduce you all, Megan from Stripe. Megan, will you please share with us a little bit about yourself and your role? Yeah. Hi, Megan. Um, also UCSD alum. I graduated in 2017, also from Sixth College. Um, I'm currently at Stripe. I've been here for one month, so still very new and onboarding. Uh, going to be working on recruiting for the Risk Product and Strategy Org. Prior to Stripe, I was at Robinhood for about three years, recruiting for lots of things within the non-technical side of the house, from finance to workplace, physical security, um, a lot of things in between there as well. So excited to be here. Beautiful. Thanks for joining us. And last but not least, I would like to introduce you all to Luke from Slack. Yes, thank you for having us, Katie. My name is Luke. I am at Slack. I'm a recruiting manager. My focus is on leadership positions for customer success and services. So anything that's customer success guides and implementation. Um, I have about 10 years recruiting experience. Most of it in smaller startup companies right around 500 to 1,000 and then joined Slack about a year ago because it's Slack. It's one of the greatest companies in the world. Love it, love it. Well, we're gonna go ahead and jump right into our, our presentation today, our Q&A, because we do have a lot of good questions, but please, please utilize the Q&A feature on this webinar as well. If you have some questions, we would love to hear it, and I would love to be able to ask the recruiters. Um, so please utilize that throughout the presentation um, whenever, whenever a question pops into your head. But in the meantime, I'm gonna jump into my own questions that I've prepared for them. Give me a second, it's very... All right, so first off, um, you all, I'm sure, uh, have gone through your own personal experience with negotiating your salary. Uh, can you share with us what your first experience negotiating your salary was like? And um, what's one lesson or takeaway from that that you learned that you can hopefully teach our students? So I'm going to first start off with Oscar. Oscar, will you go ahead and jump in? Definitely. I think um, when just hearing this question, maybe I can start with my the first job offer I received after graduating because I did not negotiate. So that's one thing. I think this is a, a huge uh, learning opportunity for the uh, folks on this call. So um, when I graduated from UCSD, I was applying to a bunch of jobs. Um, unfortunately, I did not uh, do any internships during the summers that I worked uh, that I that was at UCSD, but I did work for the Oasis program and that did give me a lot of work experience to be able to jump into a coordinator role or a program manager role so I was applying to a lot of those roles. Um, my first job offer came from uh, San Diego State, where I worked as a, as a program coordinator there for a couple of years. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, I did not negotiate. Uh, I was so excited when I got my first job offer. I am the first one in my family to go to college and, and, and get a, a professional type job. So I was just so excited. Uh, I thought that the offer came in. It, it was great money for me graduating. Again, didn't have any context of like what I wanted to do either. So I just went for it. Um, now, um, a couple of years later, uh, I, I moved into the corporate uh, world and my first um, job was as an associate recruiter with HubSpot. So it's a CRM software company in Cambridge. Um, and then 
when, when the offer stage came, um, I did ask around a couple of my friends who had a little bit more experience or who had had corporate jobs before. And one of my friends was actually going through an offer stage at Google. So she gave me all these pointers. She actually also graduated from UCSD, but she's also first gen. We were just like texting each other back and forth. Like, hey, what are you, what are you saying? Like, how are you presenting this? I, am I okay to ask for more if they're, if, you know, if they're coming below? But um, I think my main takeaway from that and what I wanted to share as a piece of advice is to not feel like you need to go through a process uh, on your own. Um, you most likely will have peers who are getting job offers. You may have uh, either family members or classmates who've gone through that as well. So I would definitely encourage you to not sit with that. If you have questions, ask them um, because that's something I didn't do my first time around. Um, so definitely, uh, something that you know, I'll be able to share moving forward to fellow um, yeah, fresh graduates or first gens that are getting the first offers out there. So um, feel empowered to do so. Yeah, Oscar, I completely agree. I think um, I also had no internships. Um, throughout college, I worked in restaurants and like retail and did like babysitting and all these types of things that don't quite sound as great as internships necessarily, what you would think, um, but they're super transferable. And so when I got my first offer, I think that um, as similarly, I was so excited that it was like, yes, okay. Um, I think in the negotiating side, like uh, setting up front, like my expectations, I think that the thing that I look back on is that I often said like, I'd love to be at this number, but I'll be okay with being at this number. That's like quite a bit lower. And it's sort of like immediately selling yourself short. Um, so I think what I've learned from that is saying like where you want to be and just sticking to that and not worrying quite as much that you have to like say like, this is my bottom line or like, this is how low I'll go because you're kind of then just like basically showing all your cards right at the start. Um, so I think that that was my biggest takeaway. And then moving forward from there and negotiating um, was quite a bit different. I think just like having that other side of, of the experience. Mine's very different. It's <laughs> kind of a hilarious story, but to shorten it for, for this meeting, my first real professional job definitely sold myself short. So I have an entrepreneurship background. So I'd helped started a couple of small companies and then started a family and was like, okay, I need to get a real job is what my wife said. And so in going out, trying to find a real job, I was like, I want to be a recruiter. That's the part I liked the most was building teams with startup companies. And so I changed my resume and everything to be recruiter focused. And the recruiter in one of the first phone calls, that's what good recruiters should do. I gave them a low ball number just because I was def desperate for steady income because now there's a baby on the way. And she's like, that's great. That's within range. Later on, they flew me out to their headquarters, interviewed again. And one of the hiring managers above the recruiter was like, hey, we're looking at opening a more senior level, a senior recruiter, not just you know an entry level recruiter. And I was like, oh, that would be great. What does that pay? And she just straight up told me, and it was $20,000 higher than what I had told the recruiter on my first phone call. So after the interview process finished up, the recruiter calls me back, she says, great news, we wanna make an offer. I forgot, what were your salary requirements again? And so I told her 20,000 higher than I had told her the first time. And she said, that's great, that's right in line with what we're looking. We wanna make an offer for a senior recruiter position at that 20K higher than I thought. So the whole process I learned one, just asking, what is the pay? What is the pay range? A good recruiter usually will give you some kind of ballpark number. Two, not selling myself and my skill set short. I did well in the interviews. They wanted me as a senior recruiter. I did have the experience to be a senior recruiter, but I wasn't sure because it wasn't in a tech company. Um, and you're worth it. So just ask for what you want and don't, don't back down. I think that's so important what you all went over. Um, a couple of things I wanted to, to talk about again. So um, Oscar talked about transparency. Um, I knew that one of my friends has a whole community group Slack on Slack of all UX designers, UI UX designers, and they all share their salary ranges or their salary um, so that they can sort of compare what each other is being paid at what company and whatnot. And Megan, of course, went over really, really important parts about um, she didn't have any internships and she came from um, positions such as uh, working as a server in retail. 
Um, so even students now, if I know a lot of students are feeling like intense pressure right now to get some internship experience. And Megan, you're just a prime example that if you don't get it, it's okay. It will it will still work out. Um, and Luke, I totally agree with the salary. Um, sometimes knowing knowing that salary range of what the what they can offer you is really important, or else you're going to be outside of that of that range, right? And we're going to go over a couple of, of um, those areas again um, in other questions. But actually, we have a lot of good questions that the attendees have posted in here. So I do want to make sure we answer those as well. Um, so one anonymous attendee asked, "Can we do salary negotiation?" even if we don't have any other competing offers from um, other other companies and if possible how, how do we do that yeah absolutely uh you don't necessarily have to have a competing offer you don't necessarily have to be talking about your current compensation as a basis um I'm going to say this a lot throughout this presentation. A lot of this will anchor to like working with a good recruiter, right? Like my perspectives and I think my fellow panelists perspectives are going to be perhaps a little bit different from some other recruiters. You're just going to get varying degrees, um, but the role should have a certain range for a number of reasons. The um, scope, the skill set, the level requirement that they're looking to hire, all of those things, you know, are, are what contribute to the range itself. So it's not necessarily going to make a difference um, entirely if you have these competing offers. So you should still feel like you're able to negotiate based on perhaps some of the market data or the research that you're doing from talking to peers in similar industries, um, looking on like levels, FYI, looking on Glassdoor, caveat that there's a lot of variance in those so don't always take them for like your one source of truth but um i think my advice is like really like looking at all of these things coming together and then building your case for why you're negotiating or why you're asking for what you are and really working as a team with your recruiter uh to be able to make that happen yeah yeah and i knew that before we started luke was i always mentioned that we're recruiters are your best friends when you're um, trying to land a job at the company so I love that. Uh, Liz, this question is for you. So again, about the baseline salary, that range, um, subjects that you were talking about, do you have any advice on negotiating on aspects of the job offer um, other than the baseline, baseline salary? For an offer I received, baseline is the same for all employees coming in at the same level. However, how can someone go about negotiating other aspects of their contract? For example, pay time off, a signing bonus, perhaps even a relocation allowance. There's a lot of layers to this one. Um, again, being very upfront with the recruiter and pushing them to get direct answers, not vague answers. But yes, there are positions that there will be no negotiating for. A lot of tech companies that I've worked at, very specific positions, this is what we pay and everyone starts at the same. So even with an entry-level customer success manager, tech support, sales, everyone that starts on the sales team has the exact same OTE, the same base pay, it all is about the commission. So being open and upfront with the recruiter, hopefully a recruiter will be open and front. Just that that's how I always was, especially with the um, say tech support that I was hiring at the time was $18 an hour. And I just let them know, hey, this position pays $18 an hour. There's no negotiating. Everyone starts at the same. However, every six months, there's a performance review. Keep that in mind. You can get raises every six months. Um, extra PTO. I have negotiated that for candidates because we were maxed out on everything else. That one usually is not an easier lever to pull. Most companies now are going to unlimited PTO, and it gets really sticky when Josh has 20 days of PTO and everyone else has 10. It's, it's something that's talked about more than a base pay, where usually people don't talk about pay with their, with their coworkers. Um, other things that, yes, you should always push for, sign-on bonus. Always ask for a sign-on bonus. Um, you can, the worst they'll say is no. Um, and then stock and equity. Again, the recruiter should give you some kind of guardrails or guidelines to work with in the beginning, letting them know what is available. And so some of my positions, I let them know, equity is not available for this position. Mm -hmm. But if you're a really good candidate, we can try and get your base up higher than our original discussion. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, definitely. I like that. Um, 
Um, so the next question, I know some of our attendees asked it in the Q&A, so I, they're, they're definitely curious about this part. Uh, when should one negotiate their salary? Is there ever a time when you shouldn't negotiate? And is it acceptable to negotiate later in the role? And I do want to add in, some attendees are wondering if they can negotiate like midway through um, their their position, or if they're an intern, can they negotiate? Uh, so hopefully, um, those, that wasn't too many questions all at once that I'm shooting at you. Um, but Oscar, you can chime in for this question. I would love that. Yeah, this is a loaded question, so I may just be able to answer uh, first part of it. But I think I actually used to recruit for sales roles and. Uh, knowing that, you know, the uh, sales folks have the ability to close you right from the get-go is like one of the skills that I actually learned as a recruiter. So there's a saying that they would always be closing uh, and always setting the right expectations from the beginning, right? So I feel like I learned a lot from our, our sales uh, account executives there. So I would say that um, by putting everything on the table from the first call, right? Uh, if you talk about compensation and if the recruiter is able to talk about compensation and setting the right expectations. And if there's not a match for what you're looking for, I think, you know, it makes no sense for you, for you both to continue that. You know, you're going to invest, invest time in preparing for interviews. You're going to invest time in the hiring manager's time. So um, I think if you don't align at the beginning, then I think that's when you can pull a plug. But even if you don't do it at, at the first, um, on the first call, uh, you can still do it in the, like, uh, during the check-in conversations or at the end? I think there's no right or wrong answer, but I would say um, if you are able to be transparent from the get-go, I think that would be my, my recommendation for sure. Thank you. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I think being as transparent as you can, as early on as you can, um, I would say that some recruiters will start that conversation in your very first touch point. Um, some will hold off until they get a better idea of where your level may land and where that may impact how you fall within the band. Some may be honest about that. Um, it's totally fine to ask the recruiter what the salary range is, um, depending, there's also different types of laws for different states. So California has a disclosure Closure that uh, companies are required to share a, a portion of the range if they are asked and it's like upon reasonable request. So there's different pieces to that, but it's totally fine to ask like what their expectation is. Um, and then for you to be able to share like what you're looking for, again, based on what you've been doing um, in your own research. But I think, you know, as Oscar said, I think that there's no, um, there's no such thing as like talking about it too early. Um, I guess too late would be like at the very end, you know, when you're like getting your numbers, but um, that would be my kind of guidance. Yeah, uh, in the beginning, the recruiter and the company have kind of the power, or if you could say it's that they have the cards, this is the position, this is what you're applying for, you know, interviewing for, this is how it works. Mm -hmm. Once the interviewing is finished and the company wants to make an offer, all of the power then switches to the candidate. But we want to set the guardrails from both sides at the beginning. So kind of like what Megan said, well, I want this number, but I'd be willing to take this number. Do provide a range, an honest range. So if we use, let's say 80,000, somebody had put in here, you know, they have 80,000 base from a reputable company. Pick the number that you want, but give a range. So 80 to 100, not 80 to 150,000, that's not a range, that's multiple jobs. 80 to 100,000, and 100 is what you really want, but 80 is really good for this position then your job is to crush it in the interview process and make it so they want you. Then when the offer comes at 80, you can say, hey, that's close to what we had discussed in our first call. I mentioned 80 to 100. Doing research, I feel like I did well in the interview for these reasons. I am going to give you pushback. I really want that 100K base. It's still within the range. You're not breaking any trust. You're not ruining the relationship with the recruiter. It's a lot easier for a recruiter and a manager to either change the budget a little bit, even though it was within range, or to approve, say, a 10K sign-on bonus instead of starting the entire recruiting process over. They made an offer because they want you. It's a lot easier to give a little bit of a higher number than to start the process, waste time, waste money, waste resources. So that's, that's where it is. Make sure the range is what you feel it should be at the start. And then when you do negotiate, 
make sure you're still within that range you provided on the first phone call. Because a recruiter can go to bat for you and get you more. They can also shut it down. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to say that too rudely, but hiring managers will ask for my input. And I'll say, well, my first call, they said X. Now they're coming back and they want 40K more. We should not give it to them. Mm -hmm. um, so the recruiter will be your best advocate in the process for giving you more. That's so important. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, so when we're when we're talking about um, trying to find a range, what are some tips that you all could provide for our attendees on how to even get that range in the first place? I can go again. Megan answered it really well. For more senior level positions, levels.fyi, they don't have a lot of entry level. Glassdoor will get you close. Talk and ask. Uh, your all the all the students are looking for jobs right now, or just be straight up and ask the recruiter. When I'll always ask first, hey, what what salary expectations are you looking for at this time? What would make sense? Fifty percent of the time, they throw it back at me in a very nice way. Hey, instead of me just taking a guess, you're a structured company. I know you have ranges in place. Do you mind just sharing with me what your range is? And generally, if they're nice about it, I'll just give them a midpoint. I'll say we're right around 100,000. It could be higher, it could be lower, depending on how the interview goes and your experience. And so a lot of times recruiters will just share it. Use LinkedIn. If you don't have a LinkedIn, make one today. Put your schooling experience, start networking with recruiters. Recruiters will accept your requests. It's a great way to start building a network and ask them. Even if you're not applying for a job at Slack, you could ask a recruiter, hey, what should somebody at Microsoft pay for this position? Mm -hmm. Hopefully after today, you know, you'll have three great recruiters you can ask high level questions for. They're generally about the same. I can let you know what an entry level position should pay for, for pretty much any tech company. And it's a ballpark. Nothing's perfect, but it'll help you to provide a range to the recruiter. Yeah. I completely agree. And I think the other caveat that I'll add is that um, not all comp packages will be the same in terms of like their structure too. So I think especially like you can fall into this trap when you're looking at like glass door salaries. Um, it's hard sometimes to be able to know like how much is being made up of base or sign on bonus or equity or per, uh, like yearly percentage bonus, like there's so many different components to it. So really taking some time to think through like your total take home compensation and like what you want your total cash to be, your total equity, um, and like really keeping that in mind. And your recruiter should be prompting those questions as well when they ask that question, like Luke mentioned, like what you're looking for. Um, if you just say 100,000, they should be able to clarify, you know, is that total comp, is that cash, um, and really talking through like what that all means. Um, but I, I think that it's it's good to know that sometimes, depending on if it's a public company or a private company, um, there's a lot of different variations of what your comp package will be made up of. So as you're doing your research, keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, I just want to jump in, Katie. I know someone asked in the chat if um, what we're sharing applies also to nonprofits or government organizations. So I feel like we're um, kind of like leaning a little bit more into like the corporate uh, way uh, negotiations are handled. But I thought I, I should mention that when I applied for my first couple of jobs at San Diego State, I didn't have a recruiter to work with. I submitted an application and I probably heard back like three months after for an interview um, and then I just received an offer letter, but I never really connected with the recruiter. I mean, there are different systems, right? But um, I think even at the end of the day, when you receive that offer, you still get assigned a recruiter. So you still feel empowered to ask for what your, um, your expectations are. And if they're coming below the range that you were expecting uh, from the beginning, then at least you can negotiate then. But um, I guess just to answer the question that was in the chat, um, there, there may be different ways in which you can negotiate as well. Absolutely. And when somebody is negotiating with you, Oscar, how do you prefer? Uh, is, is it via email or would you like <laughs> to have it over a phone call? Yeah, I actually prefer, prefer uh, phone calls. Um, I've actually negotiated myself for positions that I've interviewed for, and mm -hmm. I've received generic emails as responses. Uh, so I think it, to me, it carries more value when a candidate is able to jump on the phone and say, hey, Oscar, I know we talked about X, Y, and Z 
but um, you know, the offer came under or I'm, I'm so happy with the offer just because you're able to kind of read the room that way. But I know everyone has different communication styles. And so for some people, you may get more creative when, while you're writing. So uh, I, I think also there's not a right or wrong answer, but I personally do prefer phone calls. Good to know. And Megan and Luke, what about you both? Yeah, I like, honestly, I like a little bit of both. So like not necessarily the negotiating back and forth over email, but sometimes I'll like if somebody says, you know, let's say like I've already delivered their first offer and then they email me to say like, I'm hoping to increase the base from 90 to 100 and the equity from 40 to 50. Let me know when you have time on a hop on a call and I'll go through kind of like my justification. What that does is that gives me as a recruiter time to be able to then go back to the comp team, to HR, to hiring manager, whatever it may be and looking at like what's really doable. So that way I can maybe have a little bit more context going into that call. And then that helps me to kind of just have a clearer picture um, so I think there's no such thing as too much communication necessarily, unless you're like really like, you know, like going above and beyond like bombarding your recruiter, they may not like that. Um, but I think like sending an email and then saying like, let's talk on the phone is great. Um, or after you've talked on the phone, sending an email to follow up, like whatever that may look like, I think it's great to have in writing also. I always say keep the communication channels consistent. So as a recruiter, if it's text, we'll text. If it's phone call, a phone call. If it's email, we'll email. Certain candidates, especially certain types of candidates for different positions like to communicate different ways. So if we've been texting the whole time and then you switch it up and shoot me an email, it gets weird. If we're emailing and there's a nice thread for me to follow, so email thread, text thread, try and just keep it in the same place. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a preference. I'll do whatever the candidate wants. Jump live on a phone call is always great. Again, at the beginning of the phone call, uh, depending on the company, I know what the max is for equity. I know what the max is for comp. I know what the max is for sign-on bonus. I know, I know all that information on our very first phone call. Um, some companies, especially entry-level, not entry-level, startup companies or pre-IPO companies, it's not quite as organized. So just like you said, a heads up is great. In Megan's case, there are a lot of times where I would go to comp team all the time because we don't have hard lines. It's whatever the hiring manager wants to pay within their budget. So if you can do incredibly well in the interview, hiring manager gets to decide how much they wanna pay you. A company probably like Microsoft, no. A company like Slack and Salesforce, no. Like we have very set guidelines we cannot break those rules or else it goes into a different level which is a different title different responsibilities and that's another conversation to have oh my god there's so many intricacies within this that, that um we don't as applicants we don't realize um, so thank you so much for sharing that um when we're talking about the a, a successful negotiation what are some of your tips for how to really light as money talk conversation. How do we leave with both sides feeling satisfied? Don't break the guardrails. <laughs> <laughs> I know we had talked and I may be jumping ahead in the questions, but like the good negotiation versus the bad negotiation. Like if you give a range on the first phone call, the recruiter's writing it down. And so when we get to the offer, we're going to figure out where to fall within that line. The recruiter doesn't care if we max it out because it's not our money. It's the company. Like our job is to get you a job. We want to help. But if we start off phone call one and you tell me your range is 80 to 100, and then I come back and say, hey, we maxed it out. We want to offer you 100. And they're like, great, I want 130. Mm -hmm. Like the trust is broken. The experience is bad. Mm -hmm. It's, I still have to go back to the hiring manager and say, hey, they want 130 now. It gets weird, it gets messy. And so that's where you gotta do the research up front, talk to the recruiter, talk to your friends and figure out where the guide rails are. They are there to help everyone. And then there's maybe a little bit of wiggle room like we talked about with the sign-on bonus. Um, if we do get to the final offer, it is okay to say, hey, I got a competing offer that's higher. I don't mind sharing it with you, but if you could match it, I would really love to be at your company. There's no trust break in. You do, I don't feel like you lied to me, but it's a very competitive market and talent is rare. 
if you have a competing offer, usually they'll try and go to bat and up something, pull some lever that we can to match the offer. And so continue conversations with multiple companies until you pick the one that you want. A competing offer is one of the best pieces of leverage. Don't falsify that, but if you do have a competing offer, it's okay to share that. So Oscar, what is your take on um, the best strategy for seller negotiation? Yeah, no, I think um, it's definitely not a, a case that I've seen with a candidate that I've worked with, but just it, this was my experience uh, when I came over to Microsoft. So I think this is worth sharing as well. So when I connected with the recruiter um, here, she was an amazing recruiter. Um, I let her know that um, I was going to uh, kind of like not necessarily lose like stock from that was hadn't been vested just yet from my previous company. So I told her, you know what, if I do make the move now, like I won't have time to vest X amount of stock that I have. And she said, okay, I'll write it down and I'll see if uh, we can add extra stock from Microsoft for you to be able to, you know, make the decision easier for you. So I think that uh, in that case, I was able to put everything on the table, like everything that I was looking for, anything that I would potentially lose over time if I were to make the move. Um, and my recruiter came back with an amazing offer. And I think if I wouldn't have said it, otherwise I, I, she wouldn't have known. But mm -hmm. I think uh, as, as long as you remain transparent and you pretty much say, you know what, this is what I'm kind of feeling, like this would make me think twice about us accepting this offer. Um, a good recruiter is going to listen to you and it's going to go bad for you, as Luke mentioned. I like that. I like that. Being aware of um, what are the, the cons of leaving your position and then sharing exactly. that with them. Mm -hmm. I noticed a question from Larry. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that gets addressed. It looked really important. Mm -hmm. It said, thanks for mentioning the California law about disclosing salary if candidate asks. Because um, they were saying they wouldn't tell them what the range was until after the four stage interview. But that sounds terrible to me. Um, California state law, the recruiters cannot ask how much you make. And so we as a company, a recruiter, we cannot say what how much, what's your salary? That is illegal. We can ask what your salary requirements are or what you would like to make in this new position. There is not a law that prevents, uh, unless this is new to me, I, I'm in Utah, but I'm pretty familiar with it. There's no law that's, uh, companies cannot tell what the job pays up front. That, that would be ridiculous. And very much it is a waste of time. If they're gonna make you run through four stages before even telling you, I would, I would be leery of that company. Do your research on Glassdoor. Um, if red flags come up in the recruiting process, there's probably going to be something else in the company that's not as organized as well. And that's outside of maybe you have a bad recruiter. The company could still be good, but mm -hmm. things like that that are company policy, very odd. Yeah, they should at least be able to give you something. Like, I would say again, like the levels are where it can get really tricky. And so sometimes if I'm like really on the fence about like what level somebody would be coming in as or their interview performance is really going to dictate where they land within a band for a role, like I'll be honest about that and letting somebody know, but they should be able to give you something. They have to be able to give you something um, and, and then to be able to continue to kind of narrow down. So that's where I like to start. And I'll clarify that it's going to be a broad starting point. And then as we continue to get feedback and data points throughout the interview process from the hiring manager screen to the virtual onsite, I should be able to better narrow down and continue to have those conversations so we can stay in the loop. So if we get to that third stage and I'm like, oh, it's actually going to be a little bit lower than what we had talked about, I'll tell you that. And then if you self-select out, that's okay. I would rather you do that than have the wrong expectations getting to the offer stage. Awesome. And we have an attendee raising their hand. I wanted to ask a question. So I've allowed you to unmute if you want to go ahead and ask a question. Um, but feel free to chime in whenever, okay? All right. So the next question I have for you all, um, a lot of our attendees are asking this too. So in your experience, has a candidate ever been disqualified from the position due to their salary preferences being out of the range? Um, and then how do you suggest folks get the most out of their negotiations while still being considered for the position? 
I think that the only time that I've really had this happen is more when it's like, um, not disqualified where it's like, wow, I'm offended. You would want that much. It's more like, wow, I can't afford you. Like <laughs> if they'll tell me, you know, like I have a competing offer from like a Google or, you know, something like that, that is known to pay very high. And I know our ranges are not going to be close. Like I will let them know, like, I'm not going to be able to come close to that. Like, I think you're great for these reasons, but like, if I were you, I would take that offer, you know, like that kind of thing. Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it or try to like be sneaky. Um, so I'll be honest with somebody. If I tell them like, we can't afford that range. And that's unfortunate. If you're comfortable continuing in the process and willing to, you know, flex in some of these other areas, if you think about the upside of equity, sometimes you get more equity, but a lower base, um, you know, sometimes there's a greater opportunity for career uh, acceleration or, um, you know, maybe more promotions or leadership opportunities. It depends on what you're really optimizing for in those cases. So you have to think about it holistically, but I've never just flat out disqualified somebody like in that own kind of decision of like them asking for too much money. I think Megan, you bring up a really great point. And I think, I don't think it's deviating from the uh, compensation uh, conversation, but for example, when I was recruiting for entry-level sales positions, uh, there was, uh, as Luke mentioned, there was no uh, negotiating room there, but our first promo happened at the six month mark. So for someone who wanted to go to uh, another company or who decided to go to another company that paid $3,000 more uh, to start off, and then when, it, when we came to offer stage to compare, uh, I would be very clear to them saying, you know what, at the six month mark, you would have your first opportunity to, to promote. Uh, and that would bring you up to uh, this amount, right? So I think also looking at the career trajectory and where that could take you like a little bit more immediately, uh, especially for junior or entry-level roles, I think that also um, can come into play when making a decision of where to where you end up. I think you're muted, Katie. Oh my, oh. yeah, my mine is the same though. If I'm if someone's salary request is outside my range, I will be very upfront and tell them what the max is. Um, I hire a lot of technical architects. That's like one of the hottest positions right now, especially in California. And the, it can pay 200,000, it can pay 500,000. Like, I don't know until I get on the phone, they'll be like, oh, well, I expect 500,000. Great. Here is the absolute max I can offer you. And I will just show them all of my cards. Here's our max base. Here's our max sign on bonus. Here's our max equity. Are we close enough? Like, do you want to be a slack bad enough that you're willing to make that cut and leave it to the candidate? I'll never go through an interview and then just deny someone because of pay without them knowing it's pay. Like that's not a, it's not a touchy subject for a recruiter. We talk about numbers all day. There's no emotion. Like we'll just share it. Uh, if it's, you know, they struggled with the tech or they really had a terrible interview because they were not like, that's harder feedback for us to give than, oh, you just want too much money. I'll always say, hey, your ask is too high, but this is what I can offer. That's a decision you need to make. And then just like Megan said, they will self, they'll self drop out or they'll take the cut to join that kind of a company. I like that. Um, so most of our attendees here are, are students um, in our webinar today. How do you recommend students with little professional experience negotiate? I, I know we have a lot of students asking, can they negotiate internships? Um, can they negotiate later on after they've started their internship or their, their job? Uh, and what if they're recent graduates too? Uh, so what are some things that they can that we recommend them leveraging in order to have a successful negotiation? I can jump in uh, to kind of start out. So um, again, I think like I came from more of a, a non-traditional background. And so um, when I was thinking about like marketing myself uh, after graduating and after working in mostly, you know, kind of like uh, customer service types of roles, um, mm -hmm. I really looked at ways to build my resume in a way where the skills that the role was looking for were very apparent to the recruiter on my resume. Um, so if the role was really focused on 
relationship building and like prioritization and time management, I made sure that those skills were highlighted in my resume, even if it's not something that you would normally like call out for a restaurant manager or a server or something like that. Um, I think that makes it quite a bit easier than for you to be able to justify if and when you get to that point in the process in the negotiation. Um, you should always aim, I mean, this is probably you all know, like to do the best as you can in your interview performance, but a really strong interview performance can make a recruiter's job quite a bit easier in getting more of those bumps in their salary ranges. Um, because like Luke said, they want you at that point. So really investing in those interviews, preparing for them as much as you can, asking questions for interview prep, like really making sure that you're ready to go into those and like knock it out of the park makes it a lot easier. And then in that justifying with your rationale, um, whether it be like technical experience, hard skills, soft skills, um, you know, whatever else that may be, like bringing in the rationale of why you're asking for something. Um, if somebody just says, you know, I want this number like willy nilly and doesn't provide any other kind of um, justification, it's a lot harder for me then to go back to comp or whoever it is and say like, they want this. And if comp says why, it's like, oh, they just want it. Like, <laughs> so providing those reasons, again, like you should look at your recruiters being your partner and you're on the same team working towards the same goal. They want to close you. They want to fill this role, work together and give them as much context as you can. So um, our next question, so we have a lot of folks asking about competing offers. Uh, how much do they reveal to the recruiter? Uh, what do they share? Do they share the exact um, offer that they were uh, provided or a range? Um, so how, if you all were working with a candidate who received multiple offers, how do you prefer for them to carry that conversation with you? Do you want to go, Oscar? <laughs> sure. Uh, I would say uh, go go with what you feel. I think um, if you feel like you want to share and be super transparent, and that's going to make your recruiter, because you're going to get a sense of like how the recruiter feels as you go through the process, and you'll know if they're going to go back for you or not. But if you feel like, you know what, if I share that I got this competing offer that's 10K, long, 10, 10K higher than what they're offering, and, and feel you want to share it, I think I would say go for it. Um, if you also just want to share a range, uh, you know, go for it as well. And then also think of um, compensation as a, as a, or salary as a total compensation. If they're offering, for example, uh, tuition reimbursement, right? And that other company is not offering it. Feel free to throw that in as well. That, that might give the recruiter a little bit more leverage. So when they go back, as Megan mentioned, when they go back to comp and they say, you know what, like this other company is offering 10K a year for tuition reimbursement. Like how can we up our uh, restricted stock units a little bit higher? So I think the, I don't want to say the more you share is the more leverage your recruiter is going to have to go back for you, for sure. Luke, any insight you can share on that? No, my audio cut out a little bit when you were asking the question. So I was guessing what the question was based <laughs> on Megan and Oscar's answers. No worries. It's about like if a candidate has competing offers. Uh, How much should they reveal to you? Um, should they give you the exact offer that they were provided or should they give you a range? And how do they come off being really like respectful and polite um, but also sharing that? Um, yeah, I think the more, the more upfront the candidates are with me, the more I am with them. So I love it when they take the guesswork out and they're just straight up, I have an offer. This is how much they're offering base. This is how much equity this is how much of a sign-on bonus. And then there's no guessing. It's when, when I get to the salary negotiating part or the offer stage, I do what's called a salary discussion. So I won't even make the offer yet. I'll say, hey, the team wants to make you an offer. But before we do a back and forth of negotiating, I want to figure out what number you're comfortable signing at. And then I'll go fight to get that approved. So when we talked in our first call, you said 100,000. Is that still where you're at or has something changed? So I'll give them a, a chance to say, well, I did more market research or I have a competing offer that, you know, we're in the interview process. And usually they say, nope, 100,000 is still where I'm at. Great. I can get that approved for you. If you're happy signing it, I'll get it done. Or they'll go, you know, I gave you a range. I would like to be higher at that 120 mark. And then I just 
I pre-commit them, always be closing. And I say, great, if I can get the 120 with the 10K sign-on bonus, do you feel good about signing it? And then when they give me that soft yes, then I go back and I run it through finance because finance has to do the approvals. And then there's none of this, okay, they came back at 130. Okay, well, they can do 110. Well, they said 120. It's just so much time. And so, yeah, if you can tell me exactly what the competing offer is, and if we can match it, you'll sign. I'll go get it matched if I can. Try and do everything up and up. There's not a lot of shadiness um, with structured corporate companies. Like, like not to use the term guardrail again, apparently that's coming up a lot in this, but like we really have those in place. It, it, there's not a lot of shady business. Like I'm not gonna make more money if I get you a smaller offer and save the company 10K, like that doesn't happen. I've never seen that before. Um, yeah, we're not trying to pull one over on the candidate. We want what's best for the candidate. If we underpay, if we somehow think it's a success to get you the cheapest offer you can, you're gonna leave and a few months when you find out everybody else makes more like these discussions are how do we try and keep everybody um what's called pay disparity we don't want pay disparity on teams yeah i but completely agree it starts over it costs more money yeah. yeah yeah i think like music to my ears is when i'm in offer negotiation and somebody says like if you can get me this number i'll sign like that's the best thing that i can hear and then it's it's like the best thing also to be able to tell finance or to tell comp, um, you know, because that, and, and then I think that's my advice for like the worst thing that you could do is saying that and then they get it and then you go back on it like you've shot that trust and credibility and rapport that you've built with your recruiter. Um, and then I think like it, some companies will, I've heard, not from my own experience, but I've heard from different folks that sometimes they want to see your actual competing offer. I've never asked for that and I've never needed to see it. I really trust that like I've built that credibility with the candidate and myself throughout the process that I believe what they're saying. Um, and I, again, similarly, the more context you can give the better. Um, it also helps in some ways like to be able to talk about the differences between the companies again, not just from an offer perspective, but like if I'm talking to a candidate from Google and I'm at Stripe, it's easier for me to be able to say like, here the differences between a very large established company and a pre-IPO company. And to be able to talk through those things, your recruiters have a lot more of that industry knowledge. So it's not necessarily doing it in a way of, of, again, like being shady or anything like that. It's just being able to actually talk through the differences from what they've seen being in this market. So even if you don't feel comfortable necessarily sharing numbers, just sharing the companies or like where you're at in the processes can also help with that alignment and timelines as well. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I have a colleague joining me. Uh, hi, Kelly. Nice to have you. And she, she asked, I work with students in a career services capacity, and students seem to completely disregard the importance of health benefits. Is this something uh, something your company use um, when you're negotiating with candidates? In my experience, it's not something that you can usually negotiate upon, but it's always a great, like you consider it part of your compensation package. Um, so as you're negotiating, you should be comparing benefits between companies. So um, I know you mentioned earlier, we talked about like negotiating PTO days or things like that. In my experience, I've never been able to negotiate benefits in that way. Um, but what can work is if you have a competing offer from somebody that's offering, um, you know, 100% of your medical premiums are paid and at your company, it's only 90%, maybe you can use that as leverage to justify a sign on um, or something like that to kind of make up that difference. Um, but you should really be comparing the differences between your benefits packages, um, especially in tech. There's a lot of benefits, so really be thorough in looking through that, even if it's like, um, you know, an internet stipend while we're working remotely, if it's a COVID work from home, like remote setup stipend, like there's tons of these different types of things. I wouldn't recommend getting so nitty gritty and comparing every single like line item one to one, but if it's a big ticket item that's really important to you, you should feel comfortable bringing that up and talking about the differences with your recruiter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, was, yeah, so our part of our compensation package, probably same you know, Stripe and, and Microsoft, 401k match can be huge to some people. And it's everything, even though it's 
in the end, it's about five thousand dollars, uh, give or take. But they want to know, and that's fine. Like Slack, we do a one for one match. So you put in one dollar, we put in one dollar. It caps at about six thousand dollars. Some companies will only do a fifty percent match. So if it really matters that much to you, there is going to be some math where, okay, well they offer up to six thousand, but it's only fifty percent match. Okay, you now have to put in twelve thousand dollars to get a $6,000 401k match. Is that really even something that you're gonna be willing to do at this stage or with the salary is put up 12,000 a year into a 401k? Uh, tuition reimbursement, Slack does about $6,000 in continuing education. If you want to get certifications for coding boot camps or just go back to school, um, what does the PTO look like? How many days do you not have to work that you're actually getting paid for? Uh, we reimburse $100 a month for wellness. If you want to go to the chiropractor, massages, gym, even things like golf, like they'll comp 100 and they'll pay $50 for my internet. They'll pay, you know, $1,000 for me to build an at-home office because I'm a remote employee. Like That's a big ticket item. Totally at where Megan's coming from. Some candidates want to get in the weeds and really add it all up. What's important to you? That's what you need to fight for. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul. So we're almost nearing the end, but we're going to try to sneak in some more questions. I see we have so many questions, but we're going to do our best to hit um, just a couple more before we end. Um, I knew that somebody asked, uh, you know, if, if the person you are negotiating with is the hiring manager, and I know Lucy earlier, you mentioned this, um, and, and if you don't have a recruiter that will go to bat for you, how should you navigate this conversation with the direct hiring manager? It's the exact same as the recruiter. Mm -hmm. I, this is the range I want. This is why. This is what the market shows. It, it's no different than having a middleman, you could say, a recruiter. Uh, the negotiation will be the same. Gotcha. gotcha. And Oscar, this next question is for you. Did folks negotiate again after accepting the offer? I know we brushed this a little bit in the beginning, but they said, say another offer with a larger number comes in after accepting the current offer. Is it okay to ask the current position to match that? I wouldn't say it wouldn't hurt to ask. But my answer as a, as a recruiter for the roles that I work with is once you sign, you know, you agree to the terms. It's actually a contract, not a contract, but it's a, a, an agreement that you're signing. Um, but you never know. What if it's a, a, a startup who has a lot more uh, like leniency to, to add extra um, a compensation at the end of the day? Or, you know, you never know which um, a company you're interviewing with, but I wouldn't say it wouldn't hurt to ask, even if I already signed, but chances are that they may not. Thank you. And we have Nicole asking for you all to share your insight on her situation right now. Let's say you have an offer from a very well-known company for 80K base with a 10K sign-on bonus. And they say that the 80K is non-negotiable since it is their starting salary for someone starting out from college. And you have another offer for 95K from a less well-known company with a 10% end of year bonus. Um, which one would you choose? And I know I feel like this is like, it depends on your circumstance and what you're willing to be flexible with, but could you all chime in a little bit about that? I think there's so much more context that you need to also be like thinking about and that all three of us will probably be asking you with this. And so like maybe questions to ask yourself. And um, like I mentioned earlier, I think it's really important to think about like your career trajectory as well. Um, so thinking about like what those leadership opportunities are like, um, maybe what the like leveling experience may be like. Um, I think there's pros and cons to being at a well-known company and to being at a startup. Um, in some cases, you get quite a bit more scope or you know opportunities to work directly with leadership. You have a lot more of that room for like accelerated growth. In larger companies, you may have a much wider network of folks to be able to learn from and to really grow your base from. Um, so I think if it's like purely a compensation question, that's one thing. If you're optimizing for top dollar, it sounds like, you know, you would know which one. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're really looking at some of these other pieces, like there's a lot more to kind of make a complete decision. Mm -hmm. I, I would, as I said, use it as leverage. Be very upfront. What do you want? 
So if you want to go with this larger, more well-known company, just be very upfront. Say you're my number one choice. Here's my offer. You already said you can't increase the bay, but how can we make up the difference? Can you increase the sign-on bonus to be 15 or 25K to make up that? Or can you make it up to me in equity? And so again, if you're telling the recruiter, this is what I need to sign, it makes it really easy for us to go to bat and just say, hey, we kind of have a verbal accept. We just need to up the offer by this much. Can we get it done? So there's no problem in using it as leverage to go with the bigger company that you want. Again, this would be a whole a whole nother web, WebEx for us to decide joining a large company versus a startup. I've worked for both and there are things I love about both of them. There are things that are a struggle about both of them. It's just, what do you want at that point in your career? And that seems to be a message that's popping up with you all in your responses a lot is that if there's so many other things that come into play when you're considering what this company's offering you other than just the salary itself. So that's a great reminder for our attendees that it's not just about pay, but the PTO, the benefits, the work culture, the professional development and all that. So thank you so much for sharing that with our students. I'm going to sneak in one last question and it's about remote work. Um, so how does one negotiate around remote work? Is there sort, sort of um, parameters of how much you can uh, offer for folks working remotely or is it the same for um, remote and in-person folks? Um, and so, yeah, like uh, commute costs do determine do you determine how much of a negotiated salary you get to keep? This also varies quite a bit. Um, some roles have to be tied to an office. Some roles have flexibility to be in office a few days a week. Um, at Robinhood, given that we had quite a bit of um, financial regulatory compliance, we had to have some roles within a commutable distance. So it's going to vary, um, but it's always something that you should be talking about in the first call, even if the recruiter is not talking about it. Um, and I would say again, like in, in some cases, they will include things like, um, you know, a stipend for your remote work setup or an internet stipend or different types of things. But there's, again, going to be pros and cons to both. Um, something else to think through also is that some companies will have geolocation uh, differences for compensation. So some will go based on zones. Um, some will be like a premium versus national. Um, some are the same across everywhere. So there's going to be different ranges based on the um, cost of labor within that space. Definitely, and I think another message you all have been echoing is just be transparent, chat with your recruiter, communicate, um, and uh, uh, your recruiter is your best friend throughout this process, so be real with them and, of course, express um, your needs and wants. Um, so thank you so much, panelists. You all have been so, so amazing during this whole webinar. I really appreciate the insight you've shared. And to our attendees, we had so many questions. I think at one point, I saw like over 40 questions in our Q&A, not including our chat. So I'm so sorry if we didn't get to your question, but I would love to continue this conversation in the future. Definitely stay on top of our career center events um, should we host a round two. But in the meantime, here are our contact info, our LinkedIn. We invite you to connect with us on LinkedIn and of course continue this chat outside of this webinar. Thank you so much for attending everybody. Thank you everyone. Thank you.